A lot of you know about the Arkham series. Arkham Asylum, City, Origins, Night. But what if I told you that there is a hidden fifth Arkham game that I'm sure quite a lot of you have not played and some of you may not even have heard of? <sighs> you know what? I, I know I try to be Mr. Positive here. Even in videos like Assassin's Creed 2, I try to at least be calm and collected when I describe what I don't like, but I, I can't do this here. I was going to do this big introduction about how this game is right up your alley if you're an Arkham fan, but no, 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 no. Okay, maybe play it for a laugh, but please do not play this game. It is arguably one of the worst games I've played in recent memory, and I'm going to try and explain myself here. If you still don't know what game I'm referring to, I'll spoil it for you now. It's Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate. Taking place between the events of Arkham Origins and Arkham Asylum, it sees what is the third breakout now in six months at Blackgate, and we are tasked with taking down three of the major criminals located there, being the Penguin, Black Mask, and the Joker. This game was originally released for the 3DS and PS Vita, and from what I've heard, they function quite similarly and look about the same too. I, however, am playing the PC port of this game, and that's why you're seeing everything in an upscaled 1080p and 60fps. This entire video discusses the PC port of this game. The 3DS version has got to be better than the PC port because there's no other way that the game got such good scores. So I'm going to look at the different aspects of this game and give my general, if not abrasive thoughts on it. Now, I can comment all I want about the graphical fidelity here and the muddy textures, but I won't bother. It looks like a 3DS game, plain and simple. It may look bad on whatever TV or monitor that you're watching this video on, but I'm sure it actually looks pretty decent on the 3DS's smaller screen. As far as animations go, they look familiar. Batman moves essentially the same as he did before, and even has some new takedowns mixed in here. Sure, some people's mouths aren't animated, but again, it's a handheld game. I don't want to judge it too much. Where I believe I can offer some actual criticism is in the comic book cutscenes present at the major story points. Look, I'm not sure what the budget is for this game, but these bad boys look cheap. Which is weird, because it's not like the art style or even the art itself is bad. It just seems like it lacks a little bit of flair. Shots look awkward, and to give a decent comparison, we can look at the infamous games. I know that these are full-blown console games, but again, it's not some sort of graphical fidelity that makes these scenes work. It's the way these cutouts and assets were used that allowed them to leave much more of an impact. My biggest gripe with the presentation is the stop and go nature of everything. A lot of animations cancel each other, but not in a way that gives you a ton of freedom. To give an example, in a typical Arkham game, you can easily press the R1 button while running, and when in range of something to grapple to, Batman will execute the action. Here, however, pushing the bumper will grind Batman to a halt, and if there is something to grapple to, then you're fine. But if there isn't, then Batman just stands there like a jackass not doing anything. The issue I have with this is that in some cases, perches and other grapnel areas would be painfully close and definitely within grapnel range, and yet you would not be able to get up there unless you were in a very specific area, and what makes this worse is that I found this happening mostly in stealth scenarios, which made those encounters even more frustrating. Opening crates in the game is another inconsistency as you have to be weirdly perfect with your placement and there were quite a few points where I just had to walk around and try and finagle my way into the correct spot to interact with whatever was in front of me. Also, we should talk about the story since it's so simple. Batman is out on his nightly patrols when he runs into Catwoman for I believe the first time. They get into a bit of a scrap and as she escapes, Batman gets word that Blackgate is now for the third time in less than four months, under siege, with riots and anarchy reigning over it. We get there and meet up with Catwoman, who says she wants to help since it would potentially allow her to serve a shorter sentence. She explains that while there are hostages in the Arkham wing of the prison, in order to free the hostages located in the Arkham ward, Batman must stop three villains controlling the different districts of the prison. Upon doing so, Batman opens up the Arkham wing to find no hostages but just Bane. At this point, Catwoman shows up and explains that she made the entire hostage plot up to convince Batman to take out the different villains around the prison and get her easy access to Bane, who she is tasked with breaking out. She explains that there are five real hostages that Batman must go save, and with it he gives chase while letting Catwoman achieve her goal. After saving the hostages, he is able to barely catch Catwoman, though he is interrupted by Rick Flagg, who explains that he and his special ops have it under control. We are then shown that Amanda Waller is responsible for hiring Catwoman, and while not securing Bane, was able to pick up Deadshot and Bronze Tiger, and implies that they can be useful soldiers. That's essentially where the game ends, and I don't have a ton to say on it. It just felt like a very standard story that serves as an excuse to get you to complete the tasks in front of you, and that's fine. I really wish I had more to say, but there isn't a ton to sink my teeth into here. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't that good either. So I know it doesn't seem like this game is that bad, but allow me to transition into the gameplay and I'll probably change your mind. The gameplay here combat-wise is as primitive as it gets. Basic punches, counters, evades, and beatdowns are all that's in store here, and that's fine, man, honestly. That's not a big deal because as you can see from the footage here, 
It really looks like an Arkham game with Batman bouncing around the room, but this was only the case 90% of the time. The rest, it was a janky mess that caused me more game overs than any other Arkham game. Let me explain further. We eventually get introduced to the knife-wielding enemies, and much like Arkham Asylum, they are taken down by stunning them with your cape. However, this initiates a short-lived beatdown. Further into the game, we're introduced to the armored enemies, which are taken down the same way. However, the beatdown takes much longer. Problems quickly arise when these two types of enemies are thrown in together. You see, the knife-wielding enemies should be taken out first, because if you try to take down the armored enemies, the knife-wielders will stab you and you can't counter them. The issue comes from the controls and when more enemies are thrown in. You can only point your stick in the left or right direction. If the knife-wielding enemy is behind a regular enemy to the left and you need to get to him, you can try, let's say, punching through him. This isn't going to work too well since you'll just bounce to whoever is closest to you, and it's essentially a gamble to see if you'll be pulled towards the target you want to hit or not. This same issue applies to when you are trying to evade, which is if the evade even works. You're supposed to tap the X button twice to evade an enemy and jump behind them, but I found this not working and I'd have to triple or quadruple spam the living shit out of this button just to get it to respond, and I've used the same controller on other Arkham games so I know this isn't just my controller bugging out. Regardless, with that option out of the way, we essentially just have to bounce around avoiding their attacks, and if by god we can actually close the gap, the cape stun ability is just as hit or miss as the evade, and what's worse is that it doesn't have any lunge. In most Arkham games, attacks, evades, and stuns have a lunge to them. In the case of the stun, if you hit the circle button in the direction of an enemy, Batman will lunge towards them. I believe they do this so that some forgiveness is given to the player, assuming they are not quite close enough to stun an enemy. It also accounts for if the input isn't exactly on the nose. Here, however, you'd think that it can be a little more accurate, since enemies are directly left or right, but I don't think that is the reason to remove the lunge. If you use the cape stun, you just do it in place, and it'll miss enemies more often than not despite them being directly in front of you. Another little detail to consider about the Arkham games that gets taken for granted is that when you use the stun ability and the game lunges, it prioritizes the enemies that require a stun. Try it in Arkham Knight. If there's a heavy enemy that needs to be stunned and he's in a crowd, press the circle button in his general direction mid-combo and you'll be able to pass the regular mooks and just target him. And this works with the takedowns too. Basic takedowns aren't present here in Arkham Origins Blackgate, but whatever, focusing on the cape, here, you do not target the enemy that needs to be stunned, and considering how inaccurate the combat already is, this just adds a new layer of frustration. Again, if you can even close the gap, sometimes for literally no reason, the enemy will just block and deflect the only possible way that they can be taken down. Like, what? Why is this here? The game doesn't explain it at all, and it's so frustrating when you finally get the opportunity to stun an enemy or a boss, but you just get a few pixels off, so the game punishes you. You could argue that you should just get good, but this isn't necessarily a matter of getting good. The issue is that this is an Arkham game, and in an Arkham game, we have the lunge. So this game, for whatever reason, has decided to get rid of the ability that we have spent the last god knows how many years being conditioned into relying on subconsciously, and the worst part is, is that this is where all the difficulty comes from. They don't make it challenging by throwing large amounts of enemies at you or challenge you with precise knife dodges like the other games. Or god forbid they use a quick time event, which they dabble in, but they just throw seemingly random assortments of enemies at you and they contradict each other in gameplay. If they added the lunge to the combat, it would be far easier, even on the harder difficulties where there are no counter icons, and when seeing an enemy attacking you is twice as hard, considering his animation is obscured by however many inmates are in front of him. It's so difficult to get into a flow here because of how consistent it is. And that's the main appeal of Arkham Combat, is the free flow combat. You'll press an attack button in the direction of an enemy and sometimes it just won't work. Either the input will be dropped or you'll be sent in the wrong direction and this applies to all of your moves. It just made the combat so frustrating and it gets just as bad when you look at stealth. The stealth in this game on paper actually seems like it could work. It sees Batman perching on vantage points, and it's the classic stealth takedowns from there. You're missing some moves like corner takedowns and whatnot, but nothing that really affects the gameplay. And besides, I don't want to criticize it too much because, again, it's a handheld game. I understand that they wouldn't have the same budget or resources to make it work, and that's not my issue. The issue I have with this system is the vision cones of the enemies. These guys can see you before they are even on your screen. Considering that enemies typically respawn when you enter rooms, this means you'll be on your merry way and literally before you even know it, you are getting riddled with bullets resulting in either a sliver of health left or just a straight up death. On top of that, 
enemies track you for way too long. Losing enemies is so much harder because their cone of vision covers over half the screen, and trying to lose more than one enemy is nothing but a pain. It's all just so tight that it's brutal to properly sneak around here. In the other Arkham games, enemies would be startled by your presence in most cases, and it would prevent them from shooting you for at least a second or two. Again, this was done to not only build the atmosphere of being Batman, but also to give you a little forgiveness for making the wrong move. Here, however, they near snap to you, and on harder difficulties, hell, even easier difficulties in some cases, it'll leave you dead in seconds. When we consider that enemies off-screen, unbeknownst to the player, are able to spot you and begin shooting you, the problem gets worse. Now, there's no issue with getting killed by an enemy you didn't see, but here, you literally can't see him. The only way to tell that these enemies are in here is to stay in detective mode for basically the entire game and just be on the lookout for any orange cones. Gadgets and whatnot are useful to an extent, but when it comes to using a Batarang to, say, knock an enemy down and finish him with a ground takedown, the ground takedown, for whatever reason, has the most stubborn hitbox as you have to be lined up perfectly to execute it, and if you're not, Batman will fumble around giving the enemy ample time to get back up, defeating the purpose of it. To again reference the other Arkham games, they allowed you some leeway in the ground takedowns. You could jump pretty far to pull one of these bad boys off, and it helped a lot. Here, there's none of that, and on one hand, it's fine, because there's nothing wrong with a game asking you to have some precision when executing a move. However, on the other hand, the game's controls and movement are so janky that it's unreasonable for the game to ask this of you. Fortunately, there are few stealth sections in this game, with the most major ones being left to boss fights, but we can get to those later. What we should talk about right now is your best friend in stealth, detective mode. It functions like you imagine, and thankfully it also shows you the vision cones of enemies in the room, making stealth just the tiniest bit more tolerable. It also shows you the different interactables within the map, such as weakened walls, lights that can be cut, and possible puzzle pieces. Furthering this is the Analyzer. The Analyzer is a really neat tool, as it clearly analyzes and explains what certain interactables are and how to interact with them. Now, for the first hour of the game, it's pretty nice, as with this game's Metroidvania style, you may be unsure of where to go. For example, you might enter a room and not know how to proceed. Scan the room with the analyzer and see that there is a part of the floor that is breakable. Now, for me, the first issue is that the breakable floor and the non-breakable floor have no differences or distinction between them, meaning there are a lot of cases in which you enter a room and solely rely on the analyzer. What makes this worse, though, is that even on my seventh hour of the game, I was still forced to scan items. Even though I knew I had to interact with an object, say some debris that had to be pulled down or a wall that has to be destroyed with explosive gel, I would not be able to actually interact with it unless I analyzed it first. Analyzing an object takes about a second or two, and that's not that bad, really. But when it's done hundreds of times over the course of an eight hour grind, it is beyond frustrating, and I'm left questioning this decision. The analyzer should be something that beginners can rely on if they are stuck, not something that all players must rely on. Furthering the frustration of these scans and interactables are the gadgets associated with the interactables. Take some debris. In one section of the island, you'll use your explosive gel to tear it down. Another section will see you using your bat claw, and in another, you'll use your batarang. Why is this necessary? I assume the reason they did this is that so any player can get through any section of the game. What I mean is that you enter the industrial district and you use your explosive gel which is obtained in that part of the prison. We use a bat claw to tear down debris in the cell blocks and finally a batarang in the administration sector. I don't understand why they would make it so inconsistent though. Why not just make all the debris destructible through your batarang, which is available from the start? The reason this frustrated me was because I sat there shooting my grappling hook at some debris and wondering why it wasn't working, and in order to figure out what I'm supposed to use, I have to read the analyzer's analysis. I have no issue with reading, but the text here crawls so slow and that is on top of a two second animation of a simple bar filling up. As I mentioned before, no big deal, but an event that is no big deal after the 100th time will eventually become even more and more irritating. Plenty of boss fights see you taking time to analyze parts of the arena and you often don't have enough time to properly scan something, and then read through what you need to do to interact with the scanned object. So I've already talked about it, but we should at least look at the design of Blackgate. As I've alluded to, the prison is separated into three different districts, and each subsection is ruled by a villain. The industrial area is ruled by Black Mask, the cell blocks by the Penguin, and administration by the Joker. 
They have pretty distinct designs, and I have to commend the administration section as it feels like where most of the effort went. When you first enter, you're walking over the graffitied dead bodies of prison guards. As you get through a seemingly empty hallway, the lights go out and we hear the maniacal screams of laughter coming from none other than the Joker. And when the lights come back on, there's a handful of dead bodies hanging from the ceiling. And the atmosphere here was just awesome. It eventually became a little more frustrating though, as getting through this section, much like all others, is just a wild goose chase, which sees you hitting one roadblock after another. I can at least say that level design wise, it was pretty okay. A lot of open hallways, but there were a few different areas with quite a bit of verticality. However, the way you traverse some of these areas wasn't the best. Take this one where you have to cross a part of the prison that is on fire. You have to cross from the foreground to the background, and in order to do so, you don't grapple to the perch across the way, you have to go to the very far right of the room and grapple across to another walkway. I also have to question the decision to put random spikes on the floor. All they did was get in the way and they were not a challenge at all to get over, you just have to evade them. But what it did show me was how broken the inputs are and how inconsistent the delay was since sometimes I would get hit despite evading and sometimes I'd clear it no problem. Fortunately, on harder difficulties, it does minimal damage, so I ended up just tanking damage in order to keep my momentum going. Speaking of movement, Batman also has this strange ability to enter doors on multiple occasions and just turn around despite my position on the stick not changing at all. There are also some collectibles around the map which can be destroyed, and most of the time they serve as annoyances such as the Cage Burge, which if you don't notice, will drop onto you and bring your health to a sliver. Why not just let them hang there? Like, why make it damage us? What's, what's the point in that? It just made no sense. Speaking of making no sense, the map was so strange. It left me disoriented on multiple occasions and the strange 3D angle which seemed to rotate whenever was just beyond confusing. I can at least say that the way the game introduces the gadgets is done pretty well, as they are rolled out at a relatively steady pace and there are all the center focus within the location in which they are found. The explosive gel is located in the industrial section and will be integral to exploring that area, and will help you find secrets in other areas. The gadgets here all function like they do in the other Arkham games, but with a 2D spin on them aside from the cryptographic sequencer, which I really like. So the cryptographic sequencer in other Arkham games was pretty lame. It just saw you spinning the sticks in different directions and it wasn't very engaging. In this game, you have a series of different numbers in front of you and you have to figure out the proper code by trying different sets of numbers. If a number in the sequence matches up, then that corresponding square will turn green. And it was far more engaging than the typical gadget setup. They even add some spins to it, such as scrambled numbers which if hovered over will scramble the board, changing the layout, and they even have some that are on a pretty strict time limit. This is the only thing I can say that this game does better than any of the Arkham games. I also want to mention that a lot of people have criticized the game for forcing you to collect gadgets around the prison because why would Batman forget his utility belt and why would he store these weapons in a prison? I don't think it matters that much to be honest, it's just a video game thing. Let's be real, this game has far greater issues. Okay, let's now talk about the bosses. There are a few boss fights in the game, and some of them are pretty cool, and others are borderline maddening. Let's start with the ones I liked, and slowly transition into the more annoying ones. Black Mask sees you analyzing parts of the environment and distracting the dual pistol-wielding foe while sneaking up for a takedown. I like this fight a lot because it used the analyzer in a productive way, and on top of that, it was beyond hilarious seeing Batman get absolutely melted in an instant the moment he stepped into a spotlight. The beginning Catwoman fight was really simplistic, and that's okay because it takes place within the first 10 minutes of the game. It's easy performing basic dodging and countering, and while it is incredibly simplistic for myself, seeing as I'm a veteran of the series, I can appreciate that it can be a good way to test a new player's combat skills. A second version of this fight takes place halfway through the game against Bronze Tiger, which adds in an extra layer of complexity which sees him lunging towards you and you just have to evade him. This type of fight is finalized in the final boss fight which is against Catwoman again, and the first two phases function the exact same as Bronze Tiger which I felt was… whatever, and the third phase sees you blinded and relying on counter icons to take the thief down. These fights are pretty basic and they didn't evolve as much as I'd like, but it's actually way better than some of these other fights, and it's a handheld game so I don't really mind. I actually enjoyed the Deadshot fight a lot too, as it sees you moving through an open section of the administration through the view of Deadshot's sniper scope. It was an interesting take on a boss fight that while not groundbreaking was enjoyable and challenging as you had to time your movements from cover to cover, and bait out a shot from the sharpshooter, otherwise suffering a game over. I'd say this is probably my favorite fight in the game. The Solomon Grundy fight was pretty fun, and it works well in concept, though it slips due to how movement-reliant it is. 
Grundy runs at you charging and you need to use your gadgets to create traps for him to run into and evade his charges. It's some pretty decent juggling in concept, and when my button presses were registered, it was a good time. You generally speaking need to have some well-timed button presses, and considering that button presses don't always register, there were moments where I was just smashing the X button and yet I just stood there on screen. The Joker is one of, but not the most annoying boss fight in the game. It sees you on the other side of a pile and you need to use your new line launcher to take down the Joker, but the issue is that the game gives you no indicator as to how to defeat him, leading to some frustrations, but ultimately the thing that annoyed me is that when he's in his third phase, you have to dodge his gunshots and get a hit in, and when you do, he alternates to his cattle prod weapon and immediately charges you, so he just gets a free hit in and I cannot escape this no matter how hard I tried, and it pissed me off so much because I felt like the game was really just taking the piss at me. Finally, the worst boss fight by far is the Penguin. The penguin for me at least was the last bot that I fought, and essentially it's a fight against a few waves of goons rather than the penguin himself. The penguin is in the middle of the arena and we have to take down his guards in order to get a hit in on him. His guards however have miniguns that kill you faster than any other enemy barring Black Mask. You can't take these guys down through normal means, but of course the game doesn't tell you that, and on top of that they seem to know exactly where you are at all times the second they spot you. They typically sandwich you and if you're god forbid in their line of sight, you'll just be deleted. On top of that, enemies are always looking at perches, meaning those aren't safe either, and since you can only take these guys out through an explosive backclaw takedown that takes a few seconds, you can bet your ass these guys will be on you like white on rice the moment you make a move. You have to hit the penguin three times, and the second wave introduces three minigun guards and a drone that can spot you, though it can easily be taken out by a batarang. The third wave sees you fighting three minigun enemies and two drones, and it was beyond frustrating because there's so little room to move around, and by this point I was just so done with the game, and the only saving grace was the fact that there is a checkpoint at each phase in the fight. I also want to mention here that aside from this fight, the checkpoints here are absolute ass, as they often set you back relatively far, and especially in boss fights, they on most occasions send you back before the boss room, meaning you have to watch the first few seconds of the cutscene introducing the boss, and then the in-game cutscene afterwards, and you're not able to immediately skip these, and it was so lame. But I understand if this lands closer to a nitpick than anything else. So those are my general aggressive thoughts on the game. I know I've been a little bitch this entire video, but I swear playing this game is just a different experience. It seems like everything in the game is built to waste your time and annoy the living hell out of you. Even the credits are being taken up by only half the screen and they move at the slowest crawl I think I've seen. I was really excited to finally knock this game off my list of Arkham games played and reviewed. And while I wasn't expecting anything insane as I acknowledge that it is a handheld game, I could have never imagined it would have been this irritating. I understand that it's a handheld game, and my expectations are not that high, I swear. I'm not saying it needs all the bells and whistles of the other Arkham games, but there are some omissions here that make the game more tedious than anything. The game doesn't need special combo takedowns and a million gadgets, but when a game is on a handheld and it's restricted by the hardware, changes need to be made to compensate for that, and I feel like they've done the near opposite here. If you're a fan of Metroidvanias, this is not for you. If you're a fan of Batman, this is not for you. If you're a diehard Arkham fan like myself, this is not for you. At most, I can suggest that you watch the cutscenes online or read a synopsis, as the game is completely unrelated to any of the mainline games. I hate being this negative, but I can't in good faith recommend that you pay this game's $20 asking price on Steam. It's a clunky, irritating game that feels more like a pre-alpha for Arkham Asylum than an actual game at times. I mean, at least now I know why it's the one forgotten Arkham game. Alright, I want to thank you guys for watching this video. I'm sorry I was so, like, angry. I just... <laughs> I wrote this script and did the voiceover while still being on like the, I don't know, the high of just being like beyond fucking frustrated at a game, which I have not been in a while. And yeah, I just felt like I just need to rant for a bit. Um, I apologize that this came off as like condescending or like rude. Um, it, it, that's not really what I was going for. It was more just like, I'm just going to yell for a bit. And uh, it's also just, you know, if you like the game, I have no quarrels with you and I'm like I'm there there are things to like it was just there was a bunch of stuff that didn't work for me um and so yeah and so I just you know obviously I'd say I don't recommend you give it a shot because I, I truly think it's not worth the money but if you have tried it and you think it's awesome I don't want to take that away from you um I want to say thanks to our gold tier patrons Bossian22, Christopher Moreno, Francis Pop, Predica, and Pyrite Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. And I also want to say thank you to our silver tier patrons, Dr. Nanner, Jacob Douglas, and Chiefy. 
Finally, for the Bronze Boys, we have Denzel Ritesh and Nathan Figs. I appreciate your guys' support on the channel, and I appreciate your support on the most recent Infamous 2 video. I was actually surprised at how well that did. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you guys like it. Uh, you know, I, I've said this before, but I don't want you guys to expect these hour-long videos. Um, I know the last three videos I've posted have been an hour long, barring the Tetris video, but I, you know, I don't want that to be the standard. I like my 30 to 45 minute range that I typically, uh, stay in. And I don't plan to go outside of that anytime soon. So yeah, I hope you guys uh, are staying safe and healthy and, um, yeah, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. I love you guys. I'll see you guys next time. Oh, also, by the way, you can follow me on Twitter and look at my Patreon if you want to see these videos up to three days early. Okay, sorry. Bye.